Well, hello, English 111 students. This is Dr. Mark Tinsley, and we are in, can you believe it, week four of our fall 2020 class. This is September the 14th through the 20th. And this week, what you need to be reading is chapter five in your textbook. And, uh, and then we're going to be taking quiz two this week as well. So chapter five and quiz two. So if you haven't read, read chapter five yet, I'd encourage you to, to stop right now, pause this presentation, go read chapter five, won't, won't take you very long, and then come back and watch this presentation. This week we're going to be talking about logical fallacies, okay? Logical fallacies. But first, we need to talk about this essay number one. This thing is not going away. So where are we with essay number one? Well, first of all, we, we chose our topics and our assertions. And I've given you your feedback on that earlier this, uh, well, earlier in week three. So here in week four, not only are you going to read chapter five and not only are you going to take quiz number two, but you're also going to write your rough draft. Okay, rough draft drafts are due at the end of this week. I'll talk about this again at the at the conclusion of this presentation, but please remember that by this Sunday, September 20th, you need to turn in, or you have the option of turning in your rough draft. Let me explain what that means. Um, I don't require in this online version that everybody turn in a rough draft. Um, I want you to. And I want to be able to give you some feedback on your rough draft. However, if you don't want to turn one in, you don't have to. There are a few points of extra credit awarded if you do turn in your rough draft. It's not a lot, but a, a few points. I get five points maybe. Um, but And that's five points out of the thousand that you get for this class. So it's a small amount of, uh, of points. But at the same time, it gives you the opportunity to earn some extra credit and also for me to look at your paper. Now, I'm not going to read these rough drafts in detail. I'm going to kind of peruse them, skim them over, give them a once over and say, hey, this is, I think you're going, you know, you're going in the right direction here. Maybe you need to think about doing something different there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But this week is rough draft week. So you got a lot going on this week. You got to read a chapter, you've got to take a quiz, quiz number two, and you have to, uh, uh, turn in, or at least complete, turn in if you wish, uh, your rough draft for essay number one. These rough drafts need to be four to five pages long. Now, folks, please don't make your rough your your, your papers two pages or three pages. We have got to write a significant amount in this class. We have to, to write more than 15 pages, as you remember from the syllabus. If you don't meet the page requirements in these four, four essays, you will not meet that requirement. And technically, I would have to fail you for the class. So make sure your papers are four to five pages. Now, four to five pages means doesn't count the title page and it doesn't count any bibliographies. Okay? Now, we don't have any research requirement, no, no requirement for a bibliography in this first essay. But when we do uh, have bibliographies in essays two, three, and four, that those pages do not count towards this four to five page uh, limit. Also, if you only have two lines of writing on a page, that does not count as a page. So let's say you have three full pages of writing and then two lines on the fourth page. That is not a four page paper. That is a three page paper. In order to, for a page to count, you really you have to fill up at least half of the page. So if you have three full pages of writing and then a half a page of writing, then you, uh, then you have four pages. But anything less than a half a page does not count as a page. So just be cognizant of that as you're going through your paper. I need you to, to hear me on this, though. It has to be four to five written pages. Title pages and bibliographies do not count. You also need to remember that this that your, your paper needs to be written in 12-point font. Times New Roman or Courier needs to be double-spaced with one-inch margins, top, bottom, right, and left. All right? It needs to be typed. The final draft needs to be typed. And your rough draft, if you turn it in, is going to have to be typed. Though, um, I guess if you wanted to take a picture in PDF and upload it to Canvas, you could do that. But I think it's just as easy to type it. Um, but that's only for the rough draft. Final copies must be typed. I don't have it on here, but 
this first paper, I've had a few people ask me, is it MLA? Is it APA? I don't have a format as far as MLA or APA because I haven't taught you the format yet of MLA. MLA is the standard for this course. But what I am expecting for this paper is 12 point font times New Roman or Courier, double space, one inch margins all around. If you have that, you'll be good to go. Also, the other thing about this paper is that it needs to make emotional appeals throughout. Remember, we can appeal through pathos, ethos, or logos. You need to have some pathos, some emotional appeal in this paper. It doesn't have to be fully emotional appeal. In fact, great papers have all three. They have some pathos, they have some ethos, they have some logos. But I need you to make sure that there is some pathos in your paper. You're going to make some emotional appeals. You're going to try to stir my emotion as your reader. Make me feel what it is you want me to feel. Okay? I know that's a lot. But soak in this slide right here. These are the things that you need to know for this paper. This is the format, as it were, for this paper. And I need you to follow this. Um, okay? All right, let's go to the next slide. And let's talk about the essay in a little more detail as far as the content. Uh, the essay should have an introduction with a clearly defined thesis statement. Now, we worked on thesis statements, topic, and assertions. Uh, which is, that's what a thesis statement is, right? A thesis statement contains a topic and assertion. It is defensible, that is, it's more than an opinion, and it is narrow. In other words, it focuses on one specific thing. And that was my comment to some of you when I looked at your assertions. I said, you're trying to do too much. Focus on one thing. I, I have to say, though, that there were a lot of good uh, topics and assertions um, in, in both of my classes. Uh, you all are on the right track, so keep doing what you're doing, working hard, and you'll be good to go. But this essay should have an introduction. You got to have a paragraph that tells me what we're talking about. And the last sentence of that paragraph should be this one sentence thesis statement that includes your topic, your assertion, or your claim. It needs to be narrow and it needs to be defensible. Okay. If you're starting to say things like, I think, or I believe, or I feel, those are emotion words. And those can, those are opinion words and they can't really be defended. Make your statement bold. I put this in some of my comments back to you. Just state what it is that you're going to claim. Okay? Be direct. I use abortion a lot, the abortion issue a lot in my uh, examples. And so if you're going to be a pro-lifer and you say, abortion should be illegal. See, I just said that abortion should be illegal. I made it really clear, stated it right up front, didn't mince any words, didn't think I think abortion should be, or I believe abortion should be illegal, or I feel like abortion should be illegal. No, I just stated it. As a matter of fact, abortion should be illegal. Say you're a pro-choicer, same thing. Abortion should be legalized, right? That's how you would say it. Don't say, I feel like abortion should be legalized. No, no, just say it. What is it? Abortion should be legalized, or remain legalized, I should say, right? So you just say it. Boom, hit it right up front. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, contact me. We'll talk about it. All right, no problem. I love talking to students. Okay, once you get past that introductory paragraph, and by the way, we're going to talk in detail about what an introduction includes in future lectures, but we can't do everything in the beginning. We have to, uh, we have to start somewhere, and we can only do so much. Uh, so this first essay is, again, my litmus test to see what you've learned in the past. So just do your best, and you will be okay. But you do have three paragraphs that follow the introduction, and those are your three main body paragraphs. Each main body paragraph should provide it one evidence and one evidence only, or one reason, or one reason only that supports your claim, your assertion that's found in your thesis. If you say abortion should be illegal, then that first paragraph, that first main body paragraph, should give me one evidence or one reason why you say abortion should be illegal illegal. Okay? One reason and one reason only. And then in your second main body paragraph, you give me the second reason and you talk about that. And then your third main body paragraph, you give me the third reason and you talk about that. In each of your main body paragraphs, the first sentence in the paragraph should be the, is what we call the topic sentence. And it should, uh, it should contain uh, the evidence or the reason that you're going to defend in that paragraph. And then the rest of the paragraph is to support that topic sentence. In other words, that reason or that, um, um, or that point that you're trying to make, that evidence that you've provided, it fleshes it out and tells me about it. Why is that a good evidence? Why is that a good reason that supports your assertion in your thesis? Okay? 
Is that as clear as mud? <laughs> I hope so. And then, of course, every essay should end with a conclusion. So you'll see that's five paragraphs, right? One introduction, three main body, four, and then a conclusion, five. The conclusion should restate artfully, I say, the thesis statement and the main points. In other words, you want to reiterate to your reader what was the thesis statement that you were making, the assertion that you were making, and what were the main points that you went through in the paper. You say, why would I do that? I just went through them. Because quite, fr quite frankly, a lot of people, the only thing they read is your conclusion. If you write articles for magazines or journals, the first thing you learn is to make a good introduction and a great conclusion because a lot of people only read introductions and conclusions. So that uh, conclusion, when you, when you restate your thesis and restate your main points artfully, in other words, don't just do it in a rote fashion, like where you copy and paste your thesis from the introduction, copy and paste your topic sentences from your um, from your main body paragraphs. That's not what you're doing, but you just restate it. You restate them. Also, you restate them because it's the last paragraph in the paper, and you want people to, the last thing they read from you, to kind of summarize everything you talked about. It helps them remember and recall it later. Okay? Um, so the conclusion wraps things up. And... and the final thing about a conclusion is that it should give a reader a next step. That is something to do with the information that was presented in the essay. It's great to give people a lot of great information, but a lot of times when people get to the end of something that they've read or heard, they want to know, well, what do I do next? And your next steps, it could be one next step or two next steps or whatever, but you give them, now that you know what you know, do this. It's not an order or a command, but it's just a suggestion. This is what you need to do next with the information that I've provided you in this essay. Okay? Again, if you have any questions about anything I've covered, anything at all, email me. We can talk on the phone, whatever we need to do to clear things up. Okay? So ask me anything. Let's talk about it. All right. So let's transition. Fallacies. Or you'll hear me call them logical fallacies. I'm, in, in, in this class, those are synonymous terms. Whether we say fallacies or logical fallacies, we're talking about the same thing. And so the question we have to ask and answer is, what is a fallacy? Well, if it sounds like the word false, then you're on to something. A fallacy is a falsehood. An illogical fallacy is false logic. It's when we don't use our brains the right way, when we don't think analytically enough, when we don't think reasonably enough, when our logic or our speech or whatever, the argument that we're making just don't make no sense, right? <laughs> That's what a logical fallacy is. And you ask, well, why, you know, I ask the students in class, why should we avoid them? And it makes, and it really comes down to three basic things. First of all, most of the time, logical fallacies don't deal with the real issues. And you'll see that as we start going through. I'm going to go through some logical fallacies. And you'll see how these don't really deal with the issues uh, that really are germane to the argument. So that's number one. Number two, in most cases, logical fallacies, fallacies present things in far too simplistic ways. Um, they don't deal with the complexity of things in life. I mean, life is complex. Things are just not black and white. And so the problem with a logical fallacy is it makes us feel like or it wants us to assume that things are black and white and that's just not the way life is. And then the other reason we want to avoid them is that sometimes they can be manipulative or coercive. And you'll see, I think, as we go through these logical fallacies, how each one of these can be true, if not all of them, of certain logical fallacies. So let's talk about them. We're just going to go through them one by one. I'm going to talk to them talk to you about them briefly and define them. And then um, I'm going to relate them to, I'm going to have created statements here or grab statements from somewhere. Uh, and they all relate to climate change. And so I'm going to use climate change as our muse, as it were, for uh, for this part of the lecture. And uh, and uh, we'll relate everything back to climate change. Now, you could use, I could use any of it. I could have used abortion or race issues in America, whatever, but I chose climate change. So let's talk about scare tactics. Scare tactics are just what they sound like. It's when we try to scare people into submission, when we try to persuade or convince through, through fear. Uh, so an example of that would be believe in climate change and do something about it or the earth is going to boil over and we're all going to die. 
<laughs> All right? That would be, I'm trying to scare you into becoming a pro climate change advocate. Uh, problem is, fear is not a good way to motivate people. It may work short term, but fear rarely works in the long term. And so, scare tactics is considered a logical fallacy because why? It doesn't deal with the issues, it's just trying to scare you. It's not dealing with the root of the matter. It's just using fear to try to persuade. Okay. Number two here, either, either or choices. It's when we present things, again, it's black, or, black and white. We're presenting thing in, things in too simplistic of a way. And we're saying you're either, you're either this or you're either that. And that's very rarely the case, is it? So you either believe in climate change or you don't care about the planet. The problem with that statement is that there are people who are not climate change advocates, but they do care about the planet. And I've, I, I'm, I'm actually a geologist as well. I have a master's degree in earth science geology and a bachelor's degree in geology. And uh, I can tell you from my studies at both the undergraduate and graduate level, there are geologists, PhD level geologists all around this country, all around the world, who are not believers that climate change is anthropogenetic, uh, um, that it's created by man that it's man-caused. Maybe man-aggravated, but not necessarily man-caused. But these people care about the planet. They just don't run around with their hair on fire thinking that the, the, the earth is going to boil over and we're all going to die, right? <laughs> like the previous statement. Uh, so they're in between these extremes, right? They, they, well, they do care about the planet, but they just don't, they're just not huge climate change uh, advocates. Um, and so... This, it's just not fair to present either or in cases because oftentimes there are always middle ground opinions, middle ground positions, okay? So either or choices, logical fallacy. A slippery slope is also a logical fallacy. Everybody's been on a slide as a kid. And you know how when you start down a slide, you start off slow, but as you go down the slide and the, the pitch of the slide increases, you gain speed. And by the time you go off the end of that thing... Right, you're flying, and you fly off the end of it, and tumble on the ground, or whatever you do, fall in the mud puddle, whatever the case may be. But uh, a slippery slope argument is kind of like that. If we don't do something about climate change today, the Earth's temperatures are going to continue to rise. Now, notice there that that's probably a true statement. If we don't do something about climate change today, the Earth's temperatures is going to continue to rise. And, and so at this point, we're moving slowly on the slide. But look how it quickly speeds up and goes into a logical fallacy until the earth literally boils over, baking its inhabitants. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you right now <laughs> that there are few, very few, if any, reputable scientists out there that believe that the earth's going to literally boil over and bake its inhabitants. So if somebody were to say something like this, they've gone from a, a logical statement temperatures are going to continue to rise to a to a uh, to an illogical statement that the earth is going to boil over and bake its inhabitants there's just no evidence that that would happen and so you can see they've this they've slipped down the slippery slope things have gone too far too fast and that's really what a slippery slope argument is when we go too far too fast and we skip the logic in between because notice there's no logic in between nothing that gets us from temperature rising to baking human beings all right so we've gone too far too fast i hope that makes sense all right next uh logical fallacy the overly sentimental appeal when we appeal over appeal to emotions when we try to pull on the heartstrings of our readers or our hearers think about your children do you want them to grow up in a world that is being destroyed by climate change? Notice how this doesn't deal with the issue of climate change. This deals with the emotion around your children. Folks, this is why it's a logical fallacy. It's not dealing with climate change. It's dealing with your emotion about and your love for your children. It's not logical. Bandwagon appeals are not logical. I'm going, you need to do it because everybody else is doing it. All legitimate scientists believe that climate change is an issue. As such, you should believe it as well. Everybody's doing it. The smart people are doing it. You should too. Well, folks, do you see how that doesn't deal with the issue of climate change? That just says, do it because everybody else is doing it. Be a bandwagoner. Not a good way to argue. Or what about appeals to false authority? In other words, 
uh, and it's not necessarily that the authority is false. Maybe we should, it should probably, this would probably actually say a false appeal to authority. In other words, just saying, well, because this person is so smart and so educated and so experienced, we should believe everything he or she says. Dr. Wainwright, a researcher at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has stated that climate change is the number one issue facing the world in 2018. How can you dispute such a reputable scientist? Do you notice how this doesn't deal with the issue of climate change? It just says a smart guy says that climate change is an issue, so you should believe it too. Do you see? It's more subtle, but it's still a logical fallacy. All right, I know I'm moving fast, so if I start moving too, too quickly, you can pause, go back and listen to it again, or you can email me and we'll talk more about it. Let's talk about dogmatism. This is when you say it's, it's my way or the highway. you got to do it this way. It's, this is the only way to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm putting my heels in, 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 in the ground. I'm sticking my stake down. And, and if you don't do it this way, then it's, you're just wrong. The only reasonable position to take on climate change is this. It's a problem, and we must deal with it right now. In other words, this person, whoever said this, doesn't give any legitimacy to any other point of view except that it's a problem, and we got to deal with it now. And, folks, that's dogmatic. That's not allowing for discussion and uh, 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 conversation around the matter. That's just saying my way or the highway, and that is a logical fallacy, as is the old ad hominem argument, attacking the person instead of the issue. Mr. Smith is a moron. He has no business even entering the debate on climate change. Ignore him. Notice again, that doesn't deal with the issues. That only is a personal attack on Mr. Smith, whoever he is. That's an ad hominem argument, and it is a logical fallacy. Let's talk about stacking the deck. Stacking the deck is when you take all of your positive evidence for your point of view and you just throw it at your reader or you throw it at your hearers and you don't, and you don't deal with the other issues. In other words, the negative issues, the issues that don't support you. You only deal with the issues that support your point of view and you stack them. You just keep hitting your readers with them one right after the other. And it's almost like a machine gun attempt to overwhelm your readers or your hearers. Look at the evidence for climate change. It's overwhelming. The ice caps are melting. Glaciers are receding. Ocean temperatures are increasing. And greenhouse gases are on the rise. And all that sounds great. Great. You're saying, well, okay, well, if the ice caps are melting and the great glaciers are receding and ocean temperatures are increasing and greenhouse gases are on the rise, then... Yeah, he's right. Maybe uh, the climate change has to be a major issue. But the problem is, and I'm not going to go into all of it now because this is not an earth science class, there are evidences that seemingly demonstrate that climate change is not the major issue that some people believe it is. But this person who wrote this has stacked the deck and is not talking about any of those evidences. Okay? That's a logical fallacy. Again, subtle. Because this is how a lot of us argue, isn't it? A lot of us argue by stacking the deck. But that's technically a logical fallacy, and it should be. Because if we're honest, we need to cover all 360 degrees of an argument. Okay, another one. Hasty generalization. There are a lot of these. Hasty generalization. That's when you come to a conclusion too fast. When you generalize too quickly. Motor cars release greenhouse gases in their exhaust. As such, motor cars must be the reason for global climate change. That's just a way too hasty of a generalization. You can't say... Now, are motor cars responsible for some of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Absolutely. I don't think many people would disagree with that. But are they the cause and the reason for global climate change? I don't know. But the person who made this has reached that conclusion far too quickly and, generally, uh, and has reached a, a hasty generalization. Okay. Faulty causation. Attributing faulty calls to something. Since climate change occurred after the founding of America, then Americans must be responsible for its devastating effects. In other words, whoever would state this statement is saying, because something followed something else, the former thing must be the cause of it. And that's a faulty causation. Uh, that's a logical fallacy. Just because climate change occurred after the founding of America doesn't mean the Americans are responsible for it. Okay? That's faulty causation. Uh, begging the question. That's when 
your logic leads to really doesn't answer the question, but actually begs the question. In other words, global climate change cannot be occurring because our Earth has internal controls that prevent large-scale changes of all, of these kinds. In other words, that can't be happening because uh, we've got controls in the na in nature. Nature has controls to avoid climate change. But then the question is, but it is happening. Temperatures are rising. The climate does seem to be changing. So you've not answered the question. You've not addressed the argument. You've actually begged the question. You've said, you said, it can't be happening. And then I say, but it is happening. So what do you say about that? Begging the question is a logical fallacy. As is equivocation. In other words, the way I get to find equivocation in a grassroots level is making excuses for things or trying to mince words to get around things. That's So you're making excuses and mincing words in order to get out of something or to try to save an argument. I didn't say climate change was occurring. I said it had occurred in the past. And you go, what in the world does that mean anyway? Well, that's equivocation. You're saying the same thing, but you're trying to get around, around something that you said by mincing words. That's equivocation. And that's a logical fallacy. As is a non sequitur. Non sequitur Latin meaning does not follow. In other words, this is where logic doesn't follow. For example, the ocean temperatures are clearly rising. Scientists have measured these temperatures over the past 100 years, and they are definitely on the incline. Furthermore, if the temperatures continue to rise, ocean biology will be negatively affected. Certain organisms will begin to go extinct. If this happens, the sedimentation rates along the Atlantic coast will increase, thus causing more biological extinction. Now, to the untrained scientific eye, this may seem like a very logical, great, wonderful statement. But the problem is, for somebody who is trained in science, there is a non sequitur in here, something that does not follow. And it happens after the word extinct. Everything's good. Scientists have up to that point. Everything scientists have measured these temperatures over the past hundred years, and they are definitely on the incline. True. Furthermore, if the temperatures continue to rise, ocean biology will be negatively affected. True. Certain organisms will begin to go extinct. True. And then we have a problem. This is what does not follow. If this happens, the sedimentation rates along the Atlantic coast will increase, thus causing more biological extinction. Now, although it is true that if sedimentation rates increase, more biological extinction. Uh, will occur. It does not follow that because certain organisms go extinct, that sedimentation rates will increase. That just doesn't follow. And from a scientific geological perspective, that don't make no sense. <laughs> right? So that's a non sequitur. It just does not follow. And do you see how subtle non sequiturs can be? Do you see how subtle logical fallacies can be? We've got to be careful when we're writing that we don't get into logically fallacious writing. And we've got to remember that as readers and hearers, we've got to be will, we've got to be we've got to keep our ears open and be sensitive to these logical fallacies so that we don't fall prey to them. This is the critical thinking side of our course, right? All right, straw man arguments, another logical fallacy. All these are logical fallacies. Um, straw man are when you, a straw man argument is when you build an argument around uh, the opponent's weakest arguments. So you find your opponent's weakest arguments, not their strongest arguments, their weakest arguments, and you destroy those weak arguments. And then you say, look, I've destroyed my opponent's arguments. My, my statements or my, my opinion must be true. And that, my friends is logically fallacious just because we vest our um, opponent's weakest viewpoints does not make our viewpoints and does not make our argument stronger in fact it makes it weaker if we really want to destroy as it were an opponent's argument attack their strongest positions att attack their strongest points and evidences and if you can vest those then you've done something. For example, climate change proponents such as Al Gore state that the Earth is going to heat up and boil over. This is ridiculous because the Earth's oceans heat, because before the Earth's oceans heat up to that point, global thermohaline circulation will shut down, throwing us into another ice age. All that sounds good, um, and uh, maybe Al Gore or some of his proponents have said that the Earth is going to heat up and boil over, but that is not their strongest position. In fact, they don't say that. 
at all. Um, but even if they did, that's not their strongest position. It's not the point that we want to attack. And sure, thermohaline circulation, if you know anything about uh, oceanography, probably would shut down uh, any boiling over that would happen and throw us into another ice age. That is one of the controls that we have in the Earth system that would keep the Earth from boiling over. So you have vested that argument that, uh, that the Earth's going to heat up and boil over. But guess what? That's not even an argument they make. And if they do make it, it's certainly not their strongest one. So guess what? You've not done anything to argue your point effectively. and You've done nothing but create a logical fallacy. All right? I hope that makes sense. Okay. The red herring argument. Herrings were used uh, in... Uh, the old world, England, um, they would throw out herrings when they were training foxhounds to chase fox. And the, and the idea was if you could keep a foxhound on the trail of the fox and not have him divert to the red herring that was stinking up the place, right? Because <laughs> what do dogs want to do? They want to go to the stinky things and eat them. Well, if you could train your dog not to go after the red herrings, the, the stinky fish, but to stay on the fox's trail, then you had a well-trained foxhound, right? A red herring argument is the same thing. It's something meant to distract us from the real argument. Here, for example, climate change is not the problem. The real problem is Korea. What if they gain nuclear superiority in the world? Do you see how that doesn't deal with the issue of climate change? You've thrown out a red herring, a diversion tactic, a distraction to the real argument and said, don't think about climate change, let's think about Korea. Politicians do this all the time, don't they? <laughs> They try to throw us on onto red herrings. And that's why we need to realize a red herring argument or a logical fallacy so that we can thwart it, counter it, avoid it. This might be our last one, I can't remember, but faulty analogy. We all know what an analogy is, right? Uh, comparing two things. Um... What an analogy does is it tries to help us understand one thing that we not we don't know a lot about by comparing it to something we do know more about. So, for example, when we use a faulty analogy, we're comparing two things that just don't relate well enough to draw an analogy. In other words, comparing apples and oranges. For example, the climate change debate is like a harmless ping in your car's engine. It constantly makes an annoying noise, but at the end of the day, listening to it and stressing about it are wastes of time. Sounds good, but the problem is what? I think climate change is a little more serious than a, car, a ping in a car engine, right? <laughs> if your car engine dies, you just buy a new car. If the world dies, we can't go buy, out and buy a new world. We all die and things go extinct. So do you see how this is a faulty analogy? We're just comparing two things that truly cannot be compared, right? All right. Whew, man, my mouth is dry. Your ears are probably dry, right? Because this is a lot of information. Go back, re-listen to the lecture if you need to, reread your book, whatever you need to do. But these are the logical fallacies that you need to know. And these are the ones that you'll be tested on in your quiz, um, among other things, in Chapter 5, okay? So let's talk about just don't, don't, don't turn off the lecture. I've had a couple people tell me, well, I turn it off when you get to the end stuff. No, listen to these lectures all the way through. We're only doing about 30 to 45 minutes of lectures each week anyway. So don't don't turn me off until we're done, all right? Let's talk about your homework. We've talked about this already, but I'm going to reiterate it. you got to continue working on your rough draft. And rough drafts, if you decide to turn them in or do this Sunday, September the 20th, turn them in on Canvas, and they've got to be turned in in .doc or .docx format, okay? You can't turn them in in anything else. Uh, .doc or .docx format in Canvas. I will... A link will be up for you to turn that rough draft in, uh, and you need to do it by the 20th. If you want me to look at it. If you don't want me to look at it, that's up to you. But I'm more than willing to. Also, you got to take quiz two, no later than Sunday, September 20th as well. It's based on Chapter 5 only. Ten questions, just like the last one. Multiple choice, true, false, and no time limit, and open book and open notes. Okay, so, hey, come on, folks. This ain't too bad, right? All right. Last thing I want to talk to you about is just something I, I like to in, interject in my lectures at this point um, in the semester. And that's a wonderful quote 
from Winston Churchill. There's a lot of wisdom in Winston Churchill, as many of us know. And one of the things he says, the price of greatness is responsibility. You know, there are a lot of prices. We pay prices for things in life. You go to the store, you're going to pay to buy whatever is on the shelf. Um, you, you want an education? you got to work hard at it. Things have prices. If you're going to have a relationship with somebody, there's a price. There's emotional and spiritual and relational prices that have to be paid, right? Some are tangible prices, things that we pay. Other things are intangible. But everything has a cost to it. And greatness has a cost as well. And that great that the cost of greatness or success is responsibility greatness and success do not come easy i want to stress this to you many of you have hopes of greatness in your life you either want to be great at your job you want to have notoriety you want to leave legacy you want to be famous uh, whatever your goals are but few of us go into life and say i just want to be mediocre most of us say, I want, I want to tap into some kind of greatness. I definitely want to tap, tap into some kind of success. Well, folks, if you're going to do that, you've got to take responsibility for your actions and your inactions and your future. No one is going to do that for you, and the world is a hard place. People are going to be trying to put you down all the time. I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I'm just trying to be real with you. This is from many years of life experience. I'm 45 years old now, been through a lot, done a lot, and seen a lot. And I'll tell you right now that you have to take responsibility for your actions, your inactions, and your future. But if you can do that, you will find success, and you may even find greatness. Because people who take responsibility for what they do and do it well, and what they don't do, and hold themselves accountable. And when they look to the future and say, the future is mine. No one else says, it's mine. Those are the people. That's the mindset that leads to success and to greatness. Your best advocate in life is you. No one else. No one else is going to come along and say, you know what? I'm going to advocate you for you in life. I'm going to make life easy for you. Just sit back and relax. I'm going to take care of things. Nobody's going to do that. And if, they do, if, they, if you have anybody come up to you and say that, be very wary because they're probably trying to get something out of you. Folks, you've got to take responsibility for you. And so that's, I'm, I'm not going to beat the proverbial dead horse. I'm just going to say the price of greatness is responsibility. Winston Churchill said that. And we need to put that into our lives and put that into the matrix of our lives. Because if we live that out, if we say I'm my best advocate and I'm going to take charge of my actions, my inactions, and my future, then you have the potential for success. All right, folks. That's the lecture for week four. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you've gotten something out of it. Go back and listen to it again. Read chapter five. Take your quiz. Do your rough draft. Turn it in by Sunday. Keep up with this class, and you are going to be fine, fine, and fine. Don't get behind, though. It's hard to catch up. If you have anything, Call me, write me, email me, text me, whatever you need to do. I'm here for you. Have a great week.